Good morning, everyone. This is one of the opening sessions in the 2016 annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. Uh, and we are uh, discussing the long term. Not today, not tomorrow, not even next year, not even five years from now. We are discussing the real long term. Uh, actually, the, uh, the session is titled The Long Term Imperative. Um, and of course, that has come on the forum's agenda because of the uh, uh, growing complexity and the growing uncertainty which makes <clears throat> life, professional life, perhaps also personal life, for, uh, for business leaders increasingly difficult. We have an excellent panel um, um, in no specific order from my left, your right, uh, uh, Let's see. Well, well, we'll go, we'll go here. Larry, Larry Fink, um, Gula Sabat, Larry Fink, who actually manages uh, all, uh, more, more, ma more assets than the GDP of Germany, as I observed this morning to him. Uh, um, and he says, well, but these are not my own assets. And uh, I indicated to him that neither were they Mrs. Merkel's. Um, <laughs> Gula Sabanchi, uh, who uh, uh, chairs um, uh, Sabanchi Holding in, uh, in Turkey, which is a very large conglomerate, 60% uh, privately owned, 40% public, and in a very turbulent region, Tijan Cijam, who is the new CEO of, uh, of Credit Suisse, <coughs> who came from a related uh, uh, industry in the financial services uh, and uh, who will tell us about how his long-term view has changed from uh, the insurance going insurance to the banking industry. Dominique Barton, the uh, global managing partner of, uh, of McKinsey, uh, uh, who advises perhaps everyone at, on, this, uh, on this panel, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, Andy Liveris, who uh, is going through one of the, uh, the uh, biggest mergers in, uh, in uh, contemporary history, uh, putting uh, Dow and uh, DuPont together uh, and still keeping the very long-term view, I hope, uh, Andy. And uh, at the end there, uh, uh, Mark Wisman, who is the, uh, the CEO of, um, president actually, of the, uh, the Canadian pension plan and has to keep in mind not so much shareholders but uh, beneficiaries. Um, uh, which is uh, a very important angle uh, added to this uh, to this panel. So, uh, what are we going to discuss? How do you make bold choices for the long term, uh, and bold choices which do not only relate to one's own industry but also to um, to society? Um, now, this discussion is on the record. Uh, there are no reporters in the room, or there is no one reporting in the room, but. Uh, as a compensation, it's live webcast. Um, uh, as agreed with, uh, with my uh, fellow panelists, um, we will uh, initially uh, discuss one or two industry-related questions and then from there on move to either react to each other or uh, include uh, observations, or actually not observations, questions from the room. And uh, we ask you, if you have questions, to keep them really brief to make no general statements and identify yourself. Uh, so now let's go to this panel of uh, long-term practitioners. Um, Dominique, to start off uh, uh, with you, um, I think you wrote the other day or said the other day uh, that, uh, that technology sweeps across virtually every sector in every industry. Um, and that has incredible impacts digital platforms, networks, all the, all the consequences. We, we, we don't need to, to spell that out here. So how do you educate your clients on that? Because this is different for every industry, and McKinsey is not a technology company. So how do you deal with that? How have you transformed yourself, McKinsey, that is? Yeah, I'm not sure what that has to do with the long term, but I'll try and weave that. Uh, well, I hope, it's a, yeah. I hope that is. A, that's I, for the long term. That's very important <laughs> for your clients yeah. to understand that I, you are Brace for that. Well, I think yeah, this is this digital revolution is yeah. is is, um, is something that's unprecedented. I think we're at the early stages of it, and it's it's forcing everyone to change their business models. And I think the uh, so every, no one's immune from it. I think everyone has to do it. 
And I think one of the challenges is when you, restru you, you and often need to restructure your business model yeah. to do it. And if you're operating in an environment where people are monitoring you on a quarterly basis of how you do it, that's a very difficult challenge because yeah. you're gonna, it's not a smooth line. It's gonna, you're going to go through troughs, uh, ups and downs. And I think it makes it very difficult uh, to do that, but you have to. Uh, and that's why I think this long-term view is important. I think what's interesting is that many of the technology companies that are dealing in one of the most fast-moving parts of the world have had to be long-term. If you look at Apple and you look at what uh, what the iPod and the difficulties they had in developing that, if that, they didn't have a long-term view, they would have scrapped that mm -hmm. uh, within two years. That was a long-term uh, bet and investment to be able to make that work. Facebook, when they were doing their IPO, decided that they had to shift from a PC-based platform to a mobile platform. And you saw the share price completely tank. There was a lot of concern about what was going to happen. Um, if there wasn't, in a sense, a controlling interest that Mark Zuckerberg had, I don't think they would have been able to do it. They would have been taken out. But the view was, if we don't do this now, we won't be here for the long term. So I think a lot of the, the technological shift is an example of why we need to have this, this long view to, to be able to do it, even in a very fast-moving uh, industry and a set of forces that are there. And we, as you said, we, we often don't take our own medicine. We're about, we like to tell other people what to do and not do it. We're in the midst of a very significant digital uh, transformation, and it takes a lot of time, a lot of resources and investment, and what we're, we're going to see the benefits of that, not immediately, but in a number of years from now. So we, we, we just have to do it. You are, in fact, doing it. Uh, I, can you elaborate a little bit on what you are doing inside McKinsey for that long term? Well, d a couple of things. You know, one of our, our uh, principles is every the partner, this generation's partnership has to make it better for the next generation. That's kind of our objective function, right? And what, as we look at the technological shifts going on right now, just to yeah. be specific, um, analytics, advanced analytics. This is the ability to take, you know, crunch massive amounts of data uh, with machines. That's a very different capability yeah. than most of the MBA students that we typically have hired. We need mathematicians and so forth. So we are going to have to hire different people. We're doing that, but also retrain people, including some of the senior people, which are the most difficult uh, of us to retrain on, on how to use this. And some of our orthodoxies, like in McKinsey, if you're told uh, that you're not a very, if you, you boil the ocean, if you're yeah. li that's not a very good piece of feedback uh, to get. Today, it actually is a good, that would be good, because with machines, you can boil the ocean and get results and where they are. So that's one sliver of the change where we're going to have to re-educate basically 20,000 people uh, to be leading edge, if you will. It won't happen overnight. Uh, we're going to have to work in a very different way with our clients than we mm -hmm. have in the past. I could talk, too, about just the digital side, which is different from the analytics. So there's a lot of change that has to go on, and that it takes time, it takes investment, and it's, um, you know, we're not going to see, we will not see the results immediately, but if we don't do it now, I don't think we'll be a relevant institution in five years. Thank you, Tom. Um, Larry, um, <laughs> Now, you have this incredible uh, number size, assets under management, uh, which is a huge responsibility. I don't really want to ask you about your responsibility, but how do you trade off your short-term attention span against the long-term needs? Because there's a big issue there, right? You ha you're in this industry for the long term, but you have every minute while we are sitting here, something which is of real big, potentially turbulent importance. Mm. How do you deal with it? <clears throat> well, first of all, as you rightfully said, it's not my money. So every client has different objectives. Quite frankly, some clients <coughs> this money that are, is very short-term oriented. However, 70% of the assets that we navigate on behalf of our clients are long-term. They're either pension assets mm -hmm. or insurance assets. So the great preponderance of all the assets we manage are, are, are going to be looked upon over a long horizon. Now, what is a long horizon? For some people, a long horizon may be a quarter. <laughs> and we all have to live with that type of noise. But I think that type of noise is what we all are going to have to live with. <clears throat> 
and we are living in this world now that um, the immediacy of information is so quick, and we're all looking at our mobile devices, and we're all trying to interpret the immediacy of information. The blogs on our companies, um, and I do believe society's having a hard time adapting. Politicians have probably the hardest time to adapt, and I think that's one of the quagmires we have in government, especially democracies today, that the immediacy of information um, is accelerating in the short term. So it's very hard to ask every CEO of every company that you have to focus on the long run. Um, it, it's just, so when we want to address these issues, you have to think much more than the entire ecosystem how to discuss long term. Um, in my view, what long term is, um, you're going to have to train um, management teams and boards um, to focus on five-year plans. And that's what my last year's letter talked about. I'll have a letter out in a few weeks reinforcing this whole concept. Um, a five-year plan doesn't mean you pivot. A five-year plan is made to have an objective. It's identifiable as a shareholder of 70% assets long-term. You can take that five-year plan and then use that as a guidepost. And too many firms do not illustrate and identify what their five-year business plan is. But if more and more companies do that and discuss how they're going to navigate, how they're going to adapt to the new technologies, how they're going to adapt to the new horizons, um, how do they adapt to the changes in the global uh, economy, that's all part of a five-year plan. We all have to live it, and we all have to pivot in that world. But if you have... If you illustrated a five-year plan, and then every quarter, as an update, you update how you're navigating around that five-year plan as a baseline, no different than a, when you go to the doctor, you have a cardiogram that the doctor always checks on your baseline heart rate, and they say, oh, is there a, is there a change? We need to have that cardiogram for companies, and we need to have that process in which we all can be judged. Now, a lot of companies don't want to be judged, and I understand that. But I think if we set up that type of philosophy, um, I truly believe we could have a methodology. And it will help investors to look at it. It will then, in many cases, if it's a strong, good five-year plan, and you understand how a company is navigating the global world around that five-year plan, which requires some pivoting, I actually believe it will eliminate uh, the activists attacking a company. Um, it will not eliminate an activist here if you have a five-year plan and you're supposed to be vectoring to your left and, all the, and you see the company moving right, well, you're doing something wrong and not just an activist should be attacking it, BlackRock and other long-term investors should be addressing it because it's going against the plan. So these are the types of things I think you need. And then the other thing that I think is very important, and I can't speak about uh, Europe as much as the United States related to this. <clears throat> right now with most of my investors, I'm guided by the Department of Labor law, which is a fiduciary law. And the fiduciary law in the United States says you must maximize return. So that means you could fire 100,000 people tomorrow if that maximizes return. There's no, there's no even a comment about environmental. There's not even a comment period about <clears throat> destroying jobs for society. <clears throat> the only definition is maximizing return. Now, I must say that was changed in 2006 2006, it wasn't so harsh. In 2006, it was changed because, unfortunately, a bunch of unions in the United States um, invested on their own behalf, to, and they harmed their participants' returns. <coughs> so they made this very strict and harsh definition. But that harsh definition now is having re uh, remarkable negative consequences. We have endorsed and pushed, uh, and I discussed this, I think, in my last letter, that it's important that the DOL changes fiduciary standards to adding at least one phrase saying fiduciary standards over the long run. Right. So if you have that, then you could actually 
sensibly invest in infrastructure, sensibly invest in other things to help society. Until we have these changes, you're going to have most investors seeking the investment firm that they believe will maximize return. And that is one of the reasons why so many activists are receiving so much money. Some of the loudest pension funds who talk about long term without naming them are the largest investors with activists. Why? They're falling under the fiduciary guidelines. They're doing what their responsibility is. So we need to come at it two ways. We need to come at it on the business side by, uh, by and, I, and I, I'm, my letter will go heavily into this, the definition of what a five-year plan is, how that is going to be signature. I mean, I, as a CEO of a public company, I spend so much time on my CEO letter. I mean, we're going to have to now have in our, maybe in our CEO letter that five-year plan, and we'll go into it a little later how I'm going to try to describe that. But this is, and if every company did that, coupled with this fiduciary standard rule, I actually think we could navigate and change um, some of the standards, and we could move more towards long-termism. I actually believe from the onset of my first letter, I actually believe the narrative of long-term is starting to change, too. So we're starting to make a, a change, but I'm not sure. Right now, we're not making a significant change. We're just changing the ecosystem a little. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I'm sure we'll get back to this, to this long-termism. Uh, Andy, you are going through uh, one of the, uh, of the greatest events of these years, uh, Dow Dupont. Uh, that has lots of short-term impacts, but I guess it's a long-term <laughs> framework. Actually, I don't doubt it's a long-term framework. Um, how do you keep sight of a long-term framework while you're going through all these uh, adjustments for the short term? Well, thank you, uh, Victor. And uh, I mean, I'm listening very carefully to Larry as one of our owners, and as Larry owns most of everyone, I guess. But uh, we, uh, um, he's a guiding light in this whole discussion that we're having here on the stage. But the whole thematic for the conference this year which is the fourth industrial revolution. And I have to give you context to your question because the Dow DuPont merger, the go forward, uh, really has its roots 10 years ago. And um, as we as a board and we as a company woke up in the early parts of last decade and looked at the industry, uh, most of our industry had been ravaged uh, by being exploited for the short term. 60% of the top 20 chemical companies uh, back then had disappeared. Uh, either private ownership and run for cash or state owned enterprises. And really, the state of the union, if you looked at us and everyone around us, was that we had not invested in innovation. Uh, we'd, we'd been around for most of the second and third industrial revolutions, maybe not the first. So, 118 years young, uh, reinvention should be in our DNA. And it was in our DNA. So, we chose the path less traveled unlike the Herxts and the Bayers and the ICIs and the Rhone Polonks and the Siba Geiges and many storied names that have disappeared from the lexicon of our industry, we at Dow, the board, um, with a lot of work done by management, chose to transform ourselves back to the roots of our company, which is innovation-centric, and really get access to low-cost feedstocks in the emerging world. And uh, so we, we did what we used to do very well. I'm an Australian. I got hired in by Dow 40 years ago in Australia. And um, so 40 years in the company. You wanted to move to Michigan. That was your objective. And Michigan was one of my <laughs> North Stars. Uh, so literally North Star. But I mean, we, uh, we certainly as a company, the company I grew up in was used to these once every decade or two transformations. And so the very first thing I'd say to you is that uh, we confused back then something that I think industry is still confusing today. The very nature of this panel, you're using the term long term, but actually most of us confuse that with the term long cycle. Uh, long cycles are gone, uh, gone. And there's no sector, and we're very asset intensive, we're $84 billion asset base. So imagine the pivot that Larry just talked about with a five year time frame. Five years is actually too short. Okay, so, so literally, how do you pivot organizations that are large, diversified, global, 162 countries that don't have any innovation, don't have access to low-cost feedstocks, are being totally killed by the emerging world, state on enterprises through subsidies and the like. How do you do that in 90 days or one year or even five years? And so, so this, this whole notion of transformation to this new world order. Now, as you went through that decade, note where we are right now, uh, volatility, uncertainty, which is just the new normal, 
I mean, we're living in an ADD society, okay? We, we are totally impatient. Capital is very impatient. <laughs> what you've ended up got, getting is connectivity. What's the cause and what's the effect? This technology disruption that you asked Dominic about. Uh, technology disruption of the fourth industrial revolution, everyone knows everything all the time in the instant, okay? What is that doing to decision making? What is that doing to the ability to respond? Well, it's creating what you are living with in the equity markets and frankly in geopolitics, which is it's totally disruptive and creates no normality around marketplaces. So here's the problem that Larry just outlined. You put out a five-year plan or a 10-year. We call that a Dow, our North Star, oh, literally the North Star. We, we literally since 2004 have said we're going that way. But boy, oh boy, every single day, every 90-day period, every single uh, pathway along that path is disruptive. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means a cultural change of the most enormous order. <laughs> In fact, I happen to believe, and I'm running one, and it now gets to your Dow DuPont question, that the large diversified industrial companies, conglomerate structures uh, of the publicly owned variety are doomed. The Graham Yard's going to be littered with them. Now, there's one answer called go private. Okay, and I'm sure <laughs> Gulu will have some conversations about that. But I, I really do think, and of course, Michael Dell had an answer for it. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so, so, but if you don't go to that, you have to, what you've got to do is be very responsive to this notion that you've got to be transparent in where you make money and how you make money. There's no excuse for you on this return point that you, I'm running it for the short term, not the long term, or I'm running it for the long term, not the short term. That's out. You've got to run it for the cycle you're in, and we're all short cycle. I just said that. So what does that mean? That means you've got to be a better portfolio manager of your diversification than your portfolio managers, which means a connectivity to your owners like never before. And Mark and Dominique and Larry and some of us are being involved in an initiative that's trying to actually shorten the distance between the ultimate owners and management. Because yep. that distance has gotten way too big, and I'm sure Mark's <laughs> going to talk about it. But as you go through all those vicissitudes, you've got to do what the Dow DuPont merger is going to do. This whole notion of our sector being remade from being every, in every business, in every business known to, to humankind in chemistry, in case you don't know, everything's chemistry, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, so, so what we are doing is we're merging in a manner so that we can culturally reinvent these two storied corporations. Between them, over 320 years of history, putting them together to remake them in a form that they can keep growing. This is not a cost-cutting exercise. This is a strategic pivot to create the number one player in the world of agricultural science and the number one player in the world of material science so that we can keep growing with our customers in this sort of world. That sort of pivot is strategic. Right. We have to explain it. We have to spend a lot of time with it. And most importantly, we have to resp be responsive, my last comment to you, to the new world order of inclusive capitalism. <laughs> You see, multi-stakeholder metrics are here to stay. Mm -hmm. It is not just the shareholder. And that could get people like me fired normally. <laughs> but it is the shareholder. But the shareholder is deeply concerned about all other stakeholders. Civil society and the license to operate, if you don't actually have that in your planning and your future, you will be taken out of being able to operate. Mm -hmm. And so that multi-stakeholder inclusive capitalism pressure on top of this need to actually generate returns in short cycles means that this industrial diversified company in the public markets is gonna have a real hard time because you cannot build the culture to be agile and pivot with not fast movements, but smart movements. And I'll leave it there because I've got a lot more I can add, but I'm sure others want to speak to. Thank you, Andy. We'll get back to that. Guler, uh, I got it spelled out for Yes, you. yes, now that Andy has said for the conglomerates, uh, I think there is. Uh, yes, we are a conglomerate in Turkey. Uh, we are a, a family-owned, controlled uh, public company, as you have mentioned at the beginning. And uh, uh, I'm the third generation. So the resilience and the survival is still here, uh, for an example. Uh, but it is true. Uh, I mean, uh, there is a recent study of the BCG uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, one out of three uh, public corporations mortality rate is very high yeah. in, in the five years. Uh, so 
I think what I see, what we do in Sabanje uh, is, the, is, as Andrew also mentioned, the distance between the shareholders, the board, and the management. That distance is, is, is you know, we do work very close as shareholders with the management. But that is that requires a, a very flexible and a very agile governance system uh, in order to be successful. The second thing is, of course, the KPIs. The management should have KPIs that direct them for long term, that really force them to, be, to think about long term. The third thing is what we have in Sabanje is a long uh, cycle of strategic planning cycle. Uh, Larry talked about five years plan of navigating. Uh, we actually push our uh, uh, existing companies to really focus for a weekend with the leadership team to look for 10 years from now. 10 years from now, what are the uh, uh, scenarios could be 10 years from now for each businesses that we are in? The worst case, the best case. Now with all the tools that we have, technological tools we have, I mean, uh, the, the IT, uh, you know, you can do a lot of uh, scenarios. And uh, uh, so it is easy to really look into different scenarios. And that 10-year that uh, vision or that 10-year look is not really a plan. It is a perspective. But it just makes the management team and us to really see what is possible, what is not possible, what is far-fetched, what can be, you know? So uh, it makes you think. It is, on one hand, while you are firefighting, which is, you know, as you have rightly said, in my country we are very used to crisis management. Uh, and so uh, while you are firefighting, on the other hand, you must have time and you must have people, the brains get together and think about what can be, what cannot be. There may be far-fetched scenarios, but it's still worth having this in your strategic planning cycle. The second thing is, of course, the five-year plans. As Larry said, it's a navigator. But within that five-year plan, we try to ask uh, the management to have really early warning scenarios, early warning markers. Uh, again, it is possible. For example, uh, if the oil prices suddenly uh, shoot up again to $100, who is going to do what? So there should be plans, uh, there should be for, uh, and we try to do this. I'm not saying we are perfectly doing this, but we try to do this, and we learn this through our experience, through navigating in a country like, emerging country like Turkey through crisis. So uh, there is planning, of course, but let's not forget the balance, the right balance between plans and the improvisation has to be there. So you need to have management with skills that can improvise, the shareholders that can take collective decisions in a very short period of time. And uh, you know there are technological tools now which help us to do these things. Thank you, Gula. Uh, among the panelists, you're the only one who lives in a very turbulent region. Yes. Um, we all live in a very turbulent world, but for <laughs> you, it's somewhat closer by. So how does that impact your long-term thinking? Does well, it make it, you insecure? No, I don't expect you to say. No. Right? Uh, <laughs> no. But what, how does it affect you? Well, it is, it is you know, you think about it. You, you, you hear about it, you watch about it, you follow about it, but you don't let, the, uh, let it affect your uh, everyday uh, work. Uh, and, uh, and you don't, uh, you don't accept uh, some of the shocks. You act, you try to pr you know, uh, be proactive. Uh, and as I said, you, you, you get prepared for that. You, you have to think about alternative scenarios. 
but there are also good shocks, you know, uh, and which we, I prefer to think about the good shocks uh, and, you know, some of them uh, clear the other ones. Thank you, Gula. Um, that brings me to Tijan. <laughs> Tijan, you are not a new kid on this block because we all know each other very well, <laughs> but you are very new to a very important CEO role in a very large financial institution, which is very different from your previous financial institution mm -hmm. because it is somehow in the public mind more associated with the short term than the insurance world where you came from. So how has it affected you? Are you happier? <laughs> I have a, a, I'm lucky I have a very happy temperament, so I tend to be, I tend to be happy. Uh, Mark and I were commiserating on the tribulations of having a name that starts with T or W, because you always have to come up with uh, hopefully interesting things after everybody has said everything. So we, we are at the end of the panel. A lot has been said. I'll just try to, to add maybe a, a few points. Um, the thing about the short term and, and the long term, I'll, I'll just use a, an image which is well known. It's the experiment where you give, you take a, a vase, you put an apple that is exactly the diameter of the the extremity of a vase, and you give it to a chimpanzee. He will put his hand in the, grab the apple and try to pull it out, and will never succeed. And humans, you can run this experience with humans after one, two, three years. When they get to three years old, the kid will take the vase, grab the apple, let the apple go, take his hand out, turn the vase around, get the apple, eat the apple. For me, that, that summarizes very well all the, the tensions between short term and, and long term, because often to get what you want, you have first to let it go. If you don't want to let go of the apple, you'll never eat it, which is what the chimpanzee does. The little kid <laughs> understands that he has, there is a trade-off there. Okay? I have to forego some immediate gratification for future gratification, and I will eat the apple. And a, a lot of situations like that happen in business where you, I say, uh, I'm speaking, the head of my investment bank is there. We've just been through a, a five-month strategic planning exercise together. And I, I often say, unfortunately, there are very few things that are good both in the short and the long term. And that's called a free lunch. And if you find one, you should take it. But it's very rare. <laughs> most most, most long-term good things are challenging in the short term. And really, a lot of the, the, the job we have to do as CEOs is to, to manage this tension well. I agree with Andrew that to be viable, a long-term strategy has also to be viable in the, long, in the short term. I am not one of those who recriminate against the short-term pressures, because in the end, your job is complex because you have to manage both. You have to find an answer that works in the long term, but you also have to take people with you along the journey so that you, you, you actually are still alive when you come to a destination. So back to, back to, back to Larry's point, we just, um, we just did a five-year plan it's interesting, we, we have very um, precise kind of 2020 uh, objectives, because I, I also like to quote it's Seneca who said that there is no such thing as a favorable wind for a boat who doesn't have a destination. Okay? If you don't have a destination, a wind is a wind is a wind. Uh, there's no favorable is defined by the understanding and the knowledge of your destination. So we, we, have a, we have a destination, we know where we want to get to in 2020, but the funny thing is, I knew when I went to market on October 21, but frankly, there's no point standing up there and talking to that community about 2020. So we actually presented a 2018 plan, okay? because they want three years objectives, and that's where you compromise. Because frankly, in a free world, I would have just gone with a 2020. But you have to make those trade-offs, saying, well, you, you have to give them enough that they feel comfortable and they, and they back you, but keeping your eye on, the, on the, the real goal, which is to get to 2020 in the shape um, where, you, where you want to be. And, um, and um, anyway, I'm tempted to, to stop, but I'm just going to say one or two more things, because I, I was just reflecting on, on an experience we, we had together, Larry and, Larry and me. I, funnily, I have a connection to everybody on this panel. We, Larry owns a lot of... Uh, me, like Andrew, like Dao and Credit Suisse, always. And um, I, I, I hope you, if I mention Erol Sabonchi, we negotiated a 15-year agreement with Agbank years back, which was a big, big agreement in Turkey. Uh, I worked 10 years at McKinsey. <laughs> I'm a chemical engineer, <laughs> and I worried about, about pensions for a lot, a lot of my life. So I've got many, many connections on the, on the panel. But Larry and I went through a, an experience. We tried to do a $35 billion takeover. And I think that as my shareholder, you, you supported it. 
and it was a takeover that failed. So you're succeeding where I failed, aren't you? But it, um, it was clearly um, a very value creating in the long term, but you had all the, all the short term tensions. And when, when you've been through an experience like that, you, I think the lesson I, I drew out of it is that you, I, I will quote my father on this, it's important to be right in the long term, but it's equally important to stay alive. So you have, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if everybody comes on your tomb and say, yeah, he was a great guy, he was right, it's not great. So, and the, the, the staying alive is really the, the short-term delivery. You kind of, you kind of need to, you kind of need to do both. If you, yeah. Thank you, teacher. Mm. Uh, well, Mark, uh, that brings us to you. And you have all these beneficiaries out there. How many? Nineteen million. Okay. So, <clears throat> how do you explain the long term to them? How do you assure the long term? Well, you know, it's 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 very difficult. And you know, I and I one of the benefits of going last is. Uh, is that you can uh, pick up on the points the, that have been raised, and I'll, I'll start with the first one, is that uh, you have to be alive, but you need the courage of a dead man sometimes uh, in order to keep your eye focused on that, on that long-term uh, long uh, objective. Uh, you know, at the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, which is essentially the national pension system for Canada, uh, representing almost every worker in the country, um, not only are we managing assets for... Uh, current workers and beneficiaries, but we're actually managing assets on behalf of some that aren't even born yet. Um, so for us, a quarter is 25 years. And so we have to think uh, very, very, uh, very, very differently in the way that we manage our business and the way that we, we invest. And our, our objective, um, I think, and I think, I think uh, others are now coming to the same viewpoint, um, comes back to the point that, that Larry raised, is that redefining um, that fiduciary obligation uh, and defining that fiduciary obligation in terms of long-term value creation um, as opposed to just short-term uh, profit maximization. And what's very interesting is you change that lens to value creation in the long term, uh, what happens is these issues converge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They converge. So uh, at the end of the day, it is about the pricing mechanism that you use to evaluate um, the assets that you're purchasing on behalf of those contributors and beneficiaries. And you have to price in those longer term externalities. And corporations, we have to do it as investors. We don't do it well as an industry. And corporations have to do it um, as, uh, as the ultimate stewards of the capital that we uh, are providing to them uh, as, as owners. And lo and behold, as you start to price in long-term costs, um, you end up in a convergence model where you do create, make better decisions in terms of long-term value creation. I, I want to just pick up on a, on a, on a, on a couple examples. Gula uh, talked about this, the agency issue uh, as it relates between the owners, the ultimate owners, uh, and the managers of corporations intermediated by a board of directors. And that agency problem in public companies has to be solved. It has to be solved. And if, we, if it doesn't get solved, more, to Andrew's point, more and more companies are going to do what Dell has done and said, we simply can't create value in the long term uh, in the context of the public markets anymore. How do we, how do we, and in fact, as, as Andrew alluded to, this is what the initiative that, that BlackRock and Dow and McKinsey and CPPIB and others have been working on is how do we deal with that, that agency problem? To solve that agency problem, you actually need change in behavior both at corporations and institutional investors. And it's easy to point the finger at the corporations, but institutional investors, both public in institutions like pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and uh, asset managers uh, like BlackRock or Credit Suisse, uh, we have to start changing the way that, that we behave as well in order to uh, try to mitigate that agency problem. So what does it mean? For the institutional investor, it means starting to act like an owner. Institutional investors have to start acting like owners. 
should be an ownership that, culture. It, it has to be an ownership culture. Mm -hmm. Institutional mm -hmm. investors have to start voting their shares. Let's just start there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Not abdicating that responsibility to proxy advisory firms or not voting their shares uh, at all. I'm sure you're well aware of this issue. Um, <laughs> they have to begin engaging with the companies that they own. And in return, the companies must be willing to engage more freely uh, with their, uh, the, their owners. They, institutional investors, have to demand that management teams and boards put in place long-term strategies and then, are, and then hold them accountable against those, those strategies. So I think if you can find a way to change the mindset of the investor and start having the investor think like an owner, in fact, recognize that they are indeed the owner. Every asset in the world, every dollar, is ultimately owned by an individual saver. We have to remember that's who we're working on behalf. In my case, we're working on behalf of 19 million hardworking people in Canada. We have to remind ourselves of that every day. And what is their interest? Their interest is long term. And so we have to start representing that interest much more effectively uh, as an owner. Let me make one last point. Um, and, and Andrew um, spoke about this. We can't confuse the need for transparency with short-term behavior. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, if, I've, heard, I've heard CEOs say this, well, if only I didn't have to report quarterly, I'd have no problems. The reality is owners, owners have the right to information about the companies that they own. They have the right to that information on a timely manner. But you don't it's, have KPIs for doing that. But it's what they do with, it's, what, it's the type of information that they're demanding, and it's what they're doing with the information that's the problem. But simply saying, oh, well, if only we reported annually, all the problems would go away. You know, it's very, very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous to attack transparency and the importance for transparency in the guise that that's what's creating short-term behavior. So that's, I think that's one thing we have to keep our eye on it's, as this debate goes on. Thank you, Mark, for that comment. Uh, Tijana, you yeah, had a I comment. I just want to jump in because what Mark talks about resonates very strongly with me. First, I completely agree that in the long term there is convergence between the shareholder um, model and the stakeholder model. Okay, if I, if I run credit fees and we destroy our reputation, the bank was created in 1856, probably the oldest company on this panel. You know, the bank will blow up. So absolutely, as a CEO, you have to take that into account. I also don't argue, argue against quantity results. I agree with you completely. That's not the issue. That's not driving the behavior. Now, if I want to be a bit provocative, Victor encourages us to be provocative. I do, what, 250 investor meetings every year? I do get frustrated sometimes as CEOs because the people I'm talking to are not shareholders. Mm -hmm. Simple observation. And sometimes we get in heated discussions, and I will say, OK, fine. How many shares do you own? Don't talk to them. No? Don't talk no, to no, them. but they, they, they represent <laughs> the shareholder who's your, one of your 19 million. That's my shareholder. Right? Yeah. And often I get into a fight with somebody who's just representing a shareholder. I have some shareholders at Credit Suisse who are families. They have invested in us. Absolutely. And the nature of a conversation is always constructive. They're great shareholders to have their own money. <laughs> when you sit across the table from them, you have a real dialogue about the long term of a company. I'll just use one example and I'll stop. But in our strategy, we have um, a cost cutting program. 3.5 billion, we said we'd cost in the next three years. But we have an investment program, 1.5 billion. But the most controversial part of the whole thing was the investment program. And quite a few investors said, well, just give us the cost savings. I said, well, I'm running a company that's 160 years old. Well, surely I have to invest because, you know, I've got human beings. If I want to hire the best people, they have to believe that there's a future. If I'm just running a bond into the ground and I'm just going to generate a lot of cash and give it all back to you, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. And I actually, actually believe this is how the British car manufacturing industry, British-owned car manufacturing industry was killed. Britain is a thriving car manufacturing center. Honda, BMW, Ford have showed that you can make a lot of cars very profitably in England. Uh -uh, produce millions of cars. But all the British-owned companies have gone bankrupt 
in the same country, the same workers. Okay? Because they were absolutely forbidden to invest long term, they were turned into dividend paying machines, and they were faced with a shareholder base that was obsessed with dividends. And as a, I'm an engineer, as an industrialist, you couldn't tell them, look, I want to invest for 10 years. If I want to do this model, I need 2 billion and 5 billion. They said, no, give it back to us. We'll know what to do with it. But that conception of capitalism, I think, is, is bound to, to fail because it just creates companies that are going nowhere, unable to invest for the future, unable to reward their staff, and unable to, to create value in the long term. So. A brief comment from Guller, and then we'll go to the audience. I just want to add something that we should not mix the thing about having a long-term vision and perspective and the ownership culture. That does not mean that's one, one threat there that uh, on the, when it comes to managing a portfolio like us, on the divestures. When to divest is, is why we should not mix up with the, when we say ownership culture, long-term vision, <clears throat> we will keep everything. No, we should, uh, the, the prudent management should be able to divest by creating value at the right time. So that does not mean that. I just want I, to I, I call add that, on that. I, I, I say investing is investing for the long term isn't about set it and forget it, <laughs> yes. right? It's it's about in, constant engagement and, and constant reevaluation. Yeah. Okay. Now, to uh, increase the level of complexity and uncertainty, we're going to involve the audience. Um, who would like to speak? Please raise your hand, identify yourself, and you'll have a minute or two minutes to. Ask your question, who? Gentleman on the first row. In the middle. Yes, sir. And my name is Javier Santiso. I'm uh, involved in venture capital investments. Um, the question is, I, mean, I enjoy very much the panel. Tijan comments right now. Uh, cannot subscribe more. The question is very easy. is on a uh, way to bet on, on the future, on long term, is venture capital. Here there's a lot of investors. I know that McKinsey is doing also a lot there. So it's a question on what you are doing or planning to do or not to do in this area. Well, quick answer, Tijan. Uh, okay, me, okay, I'll take it. No, I was looking at Larry. But, uh, no, look, it, uh, absolutely. One point I wanted to make, I think, one thing that, if we're talking about policy makers, there's no policy maker on this panel, but I, I really think for me it's innovation and competition. Um, the two things that make companies stay on their toes and think about the long term is, are really innovation and competition. There has to be innovation in the economy, and that's something that policymakers should focus on rather than mandating holding periods for shares or whatever. Ensure that there is a constant flow of innovation, and there, venture capital is, is vital. Actually, we're thinking, we we're doing quite a few things as Credit Suisse across the world. Of course, we're very close to the venture capital community, and we want to do more. We're looking at Switzerland, where there's a vibrant technology community, in Zurich in particular, and what we can do there. So that's, that's very interesting. And really competition, if you think about fintech, um, I mean, everybody knows the numbers, how many billions I've got in fintech this, um, this, this year or last year. I read 12 billion, 15 billion, 20 billion, but it's good. As an incumbent, I don't see it there, uh, think about it as a negative thing, because it allows you, me to move the bank faster. Um, I'm certain that there'll be banks in 20 years from now. I'm also certain they'll look completely different from what we are now. And FinTech is a, is a big part of that. We're co-investing with inventors, we're trying with McKinsey, with others, we're doing a lot of work in, in that direction. Thank you, Tijana. A quick comment from Larry on this. Well, I would, I would look at it uh, from two angles. First, at BlackRock itself. Um, we created a, a technology platform called Aladdin one of the founding foundations of the organization today. Um, it is uh, probably the most instrumental risk management platform that investors use. There's $19 trillion of investment assets on the system, not managed by BlackRock. We created this, we didn't call it the cloud, but it is all done the same way through sharing of servers worldwide. Um, and then we started that in 1998. So we started, people were using our servers for data information, risk management systems in 1998. We were not smart enough to call it the cloud, uh, but, we, but we did that. Um, and then on top of how we're investing, um, more and more of our information now is from big data. 
We had a bunch of chief technology officers from various tech companies, uh, one very important one from um, the Valley. Um, we, are, we probably have had better outperformance in the last year because of all the deep data research we're doing in terms of uh, information related to companies. Uh, probably the most unique thing that we are doing is we are doing data search on companies on word recognition. There is, getting back to good companies, bad companies, there is absolute evidence that companies, internal blogs and, and blogs and companies, if they're perceived pro well by their employees, those companies should actually perform better. Companies that actually have their employees piss all over them on a blog, um, they're actually poorly run companies and their stock shows it. So there is some great evidence now that if you do a lot of data extraction, um, you could glean different types of uh, investment ideas. So we've been heavily investing in India and the United States related to deep data and analysis. Uh, and then third, related to interconnectivity with clients, we've invested in, in some people call uh, in, in digitized information towards um, um, intersecting with clients. So um, in every category from investing from risk management to intersection with clients is all now uh, what I would call advanced technology in terms of intersecting. In terms of investing, you know, we're one of the bigger investors in, in, in this. We, we own a, a lot of uh, uh, unicorns that we invested at the very early stages um, on behalf of our clients and uh, not for our own balance sheet. And um, it is what it is. But uh, I, I, don't, I believe for my industry, if you do not invest in these technologies, uh, you're going to be out of business. So, Andy, you want to have a brief comment? Yeah, right? I mean, um, this uh, venture capital uh, topic, um, uh, there was a book I wrote called Make It in America, which talked about innovation following manufacturing centers of excellence. And I uh, was co-chair of President Obama's Advanced Manufacturing Partnership. And the Silicon Valley ecosystem doesn't just naturally happen. For those of you who track it back, it goes back to Bell Labs and Lawrence Livermore Labs yeah. and all that. So government strategies in R&D and encouraging companies to innovate in the new new space is not an accident. It's actually a strategy. And if you haven't read a good book, Startup Nation, about how Israel did it, is a good example of what I'm talking about. So country-led strategies that actually encourage <coughs> advanced manufacturing that, that has been talked about on this panel, advanced technologies, uh, these are actually policy decisions, which is why companies like mine spend so much time in places like Washington and elsewhere, because those policies, most politicians don't understand that that upfront investment that then catalyzes the risk taking that then, then lends to your investment strategies, that that actually is long cycle. And so just using my company as an example, part of our transformation was to reinvent innovation in our company of scale that was market centric and to take managed risk in the new news space. We've actually, uh, our patent uh, generation is now six times what it was 10 years ago, but we've put $9 billion in place in risk-based investment. Now that really hits the five-year, 10-year plan point yep. all the way back to long-term. I mean, that has zero payback. I mean, I could be a richer CEO personally based on current metrics if I spent not one dollar in that area. Let me just make one, one, one small additional one small additional point 15, very quickly. 15 seconds. Which is that um, also this idea of innovation, if you're a long-term investor, you better understand it. And you better have that as part of your portfolio. So let me give you a very, very quick example. We own uh, toll roads and parking lots. Toll roads, we have a toll road that's got an 89-year concession left in it. We intend to own it for 89 years. If you don't understand self-driving cars, you don't understand the value of your toll road. Thank you, Andy. There's a gentleman in the middle who had raised his hand initially, and then in the back. Yes, in the middle here. Over here, over here. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. I must politely ask each of you to be very, very brief, uh, likewise for the panel, because we have only 20 minutes left. Yes, sir. Richard Jolly, uh, London Business School. Uh, I'm struck by this doom for large diversified organizations. I speak to CEOs who've been building uh, the delayed gratification, letting go of the apple, as uh, Tijan said, for many years. But in a world of activist investors, uh, they're increasingly having to change uh, how they behave. What is the future for leadership, uh, given the rise of the activist investors? Okay, 
one. Andy, that's your... Uh... Well, I mean, I use the term with all... I, I really, I mean, the BCG study that Gula rep uh, referenced and uh, this private ownership point that she made and, and the role of the private owner to protect uh, the behaviours of the saver that Mark talked about, I want to link those points because if you can, in fact, shorten the distance between saver and the funds and, and the investors to management, you can mimic the behaviours that Gula was talking about in terms of pivoting uh, value creation and the lens, the convergence, value creation, EVA, those techniques make you converge. So there's no excuse. You can deliver in a transparent way the short-term result while you invest for the long term. We've been doing it at Dow for 10 years and we've just done the biggest deal in the sector known to humankind. So, so we, we, we can do it. It can be done. But the resiliency of the CEO, the recognition that you've got to actually overcome whatever the noise factors are, and there's plenty of those, okay? You've got to have two ears, one mouth, as they say in Asia. Listen twice as much as you talk. So I'm breaking the rule right now. But I, at the end of the day, okay, your ability to bring all these forces together in this very dynamic, uncertain world is really the only answer to your question, and that can't be taught. Yeah. Okay. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit controversial no, 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 on this. I'm a little bit hold, controversial hold, hold, hold on, Mark. on this point. One <laughs> You know, distribution is everything. Uh, uh, Dominique, and then the gentleman in the back of the room. Yeah, I, the thing I would just say is I, I, I don't think we're seeing, gonna see the end of the conglomerate. If I look at a lot of the Asian organizations that have been a long time and have a view, you, you are gonna, I think the issue is you have to, as a good owner, you do need to think about whether you're the best owner. That's part of being a good owner uh, over time. And I think having, a shareholder, it could be a family or a pension fund, that's, and you, you then think about your purpose of what you're at, I think you should expect to see a portfolio change. I think that's exactly what, what you said. So I, I think there's, I don't see the decline of the, of the conglomerate. In fact, I actually think there's some benefits to the conglomerate because of the cross-sector convergence risk, but also it's, we're seeing a lot of, of challenges coming from other sectors. The biggest challenge for, I'll shut up in a second, the biggest, the biggest challenge for a heart surgeon in the United States is the driverless car because that's the biggest supplier, unfortunately, of hearts, car accidents. So you don't think about this, these, these things. If, if you're a doctor, you don't think about the driver, but you better. So sometimes being a conglomerate may give you ideas and perspectives that you wouldn't exactly. otherwise have. Thank you, Dom. 15 seconds for Larry, and then gentlemen in the back of the room. Larry? Uh, so obviously activists are, are playing a pretty prominent role in, uh, in, in, in the ecosystem of, um, in, in some respects they've done a, played a very good role, in a lot of respects they've done a bad role. But let me just juxtapose one thing. We, uh, we, you know, no one talked about China, and we're all, you know, China's on the, in the headlines. If China does not reform, what I mean by reform, reform its companies. China is going to be left behind because most of their state-owned enterprises are becoming less and less competitive. So they need a little activism, not, not related to what we're talking about activism, but they need to consolidate their state-owned enterprises um, uh, to be more efficient. And so the one thing I, I will say, um, the tensions we have, whether it's an activist or a long-term investor or whatever, I believe we're, you know, what Andy's doing and other companies, we're creating more efficiencies, better companies, more designed companies, and I actually believe the new Dow DuPont is going to be a, um, a symbol of the new dynacism, not, 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 a, not a result of activism. And I think we need to be less afraid of activists for a second, and I do believe my five-year plan would do that, but, um, but importantly, um, we need more CEOs like Andrew and who are redesigning corporate America, and hopefully we have a dynamic China that redesigns itself too, so it, it can have a growth rate that we're all accustomed Thank to. Thank you, Larry. Gentleman in the back, oh, and then there is a gentleman What's over the there. I'm trying to... I'm struck when I hear uh, the long-term good, long good and surviving short-term, I think any politician would actually concur with exactly the same thing. So, and we all lament on the fact that there is no long-term thinking among politicians. So your what question, would, please. What would be your advice to the political world coming out of, on this long-term perspective? Because we all live in a regulated world. 
Okay, we will take that question as the last question and ask <laughs> everyone to include that in his final comments. You all have two minutes at, at the end. The gentleman over there in the third or fourth row. Thank you. Li Huitian, Nankai University, China. Uh, I heard the panel discussions are two very good uh, point, improve corporate governance and have long-term strategy. Okay, it's good. Long-term strategy need, but long-term capital investment even cannot survive because we all live under the framework of a changing world. The world is changing so fast. My question is for the captains of different mother ships. Will the sea get tougher? Is there a crisis ahead? What is your view about the perspectives of the changing of the world, the economic world? Thank you. Larry? Um, we, we live in change. Um, and um, we live in change. Um, the world is very dynamic. Um, Last year here in Davos at a couple panels, we were still talking $100 oil. So um, <laughs> we live in the world of change, um, but the change is fine. I mean, the, change the is the only constant. Well, well, the one thing I will say, and then I'm going to leave it at that. Um, there's great pessimism now because of lower oil prices. Great, you know, and many companies are going to go bankrupt. And many countries are going to have real instability because of lower energy or lower commodity prices. But the reality is, there's four billion human beings yeah, that are going to enjoy news. lower energy costs yes. 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 Um, lower yes. and, 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 and lower inflation. Well, we may have too low of inflation, so let's, yeah, that's a that's problem. But, but no, but you know, um, the, consumer, the marketplace. The and this is what we're digesting right now. The marketplace sees these 100 companies are going to implode because of the debt structure now at $20 oil or $30 oil. Is not, they're not going to be sustainable. You see countries that are not sustainable uh, in, because of this. But the reality is 4 billion human beings are going to have cheaper energy, heaper, cheaper heating. They're going to have more disposable income. And ultimately, that's going to reaccelerate the global economy. It may take six months, may take a year. But this is all good. I mean, look, do I enjoy my stock price down 12% the last two weeks? No, but, you know, I can't change it. We are, we are going to the audience for two or three final questions of maximum one minute, and then return to each mem member of the panel. The gentleman here on row two. You're getting a microphone, sir. Yes, thank you. Barry. Thank you. I'll try and be very, very brief. Uh, I happen to run a public company. Uh, in Canada, I'm a 35% share owner of that company. I'm a survivor of an activist movement, an activist shareholder over a long period of time, and I made a transformational bet that had a longer than five-year duration. I've top, been involved in this topic of long-termism for a long, long time. I completely align with all of the objectives that you've articulated. My question is this, is where is the role of the institutional shareholder beyond just their level of engagement. When you read in the, the S&P, or the uh, Economist recently, and I experienced it as a CEO, where the average institutional shareholder owns their stock for 200 days. And I visit with these shareholders over and over and over, and they describe to me their long-term interest is two years or three years. And you know that that's not survivable. What do we do to, to put this onus on the share owner and their horizon as opposed to managements and the boards. Thank you, sir. That will be included in the replies, everyone, for two minutes. Uh, <laughs> anyone else in the room? If not, I return to the panel, and I'll start off with, uh, with Mark. Well, thank you. Let me, uh, let me just pick up on, uh, on Michael McCain's uh, point um, and the point that was raised earlier about activists. And shareholders, I think you're absolutely right, Shareholders, institutional investors uh, have to start acting like owners, have to start having uh, a longer term viewpoint. Activists, activists are not the cause of issues. You may not like uh, the sound of this, Andrew. They are the symptom. And the symptom is, they are the symptom of where are the other 97% of the owners of a corporation. When you have activists who can gain 3%, 4%, sometimes they don't even have the economic interest because they've hedged out the other side, yes. Yes. able to force change uh, for the short term, 
not in the interests of, uh, of that long-term value creation. To me, the problem is the other 97% not acting like owners. And so activists become the symptom of the very problem that Michael was talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Andy, your closing comment. Yeah, the question that was asked on politicians and this commentary on activism, maybe I'll make a comment about both of those. I, I think uh, we are here in Davos, we are the world's elite, apparently. Uh, we have these conversations, but we fail miserably in educating constituencies. You talked about employees and savers. When I'm in my town halls with employees, I make the connection on virtuous capitalism that Mark talked about, that your pension and your demand for return is driving a behavior that could cause me to fire you, okay? I mean, I won't, but I mean, but if you connect the individual out there who is fairly ignorant of the world forces and afraid of them, actually, uh, we, we have a massive responsibility to the London Business School leader's uh, question about what CEOs have to do. We are educators in chief today. And by the way, every leader of every institution in the world is an educator. And if we haven't embraced that yet, and yes, it's hard. But we get paid princely sums, a lot of us do, to do this. This is the price of entry. You've got to do everything that the shareholders and stakeholders demand, and it just happens to be that activists are playing that role right now and being noisy. So I just would grab all of that and put the word policy back into the term politician, okay? And demand some change from the grassroots <laughs> level. You have to get out there and educate. Um, I just say a couple of things. One is that I think if you look historically over the last, last, last 30 years, Capitalism, capitalism has become much more short-term and has become much more narrow. It's a, it's a fact. You can see it in the holding of shares. You can see it um, in the time, the average tenure of CEOs on many, many dimensions. It's shrunk and it's become more narrow. And that's a very worrying thing, I think, for the system because if we don't change it, it'll get changed. And I think a core element is this principal agent thing we've been talking about here before, the, the link between the owners and the operators. And the problem is all of us are trying to fix our silos. So CEOs are getting together and boards get together and investors get together. And we need to blend it together because what, what's shocking is that you get everyone saying the right thing, but it actually doesn't hang together yeah. well. And meanwhile, every we've, we've been surveying this with this group with, my, with Mark and Larry and, and Andrew it's getting shorter and shorter term. It's not, it hasn't, we haven't pivoted the other way despite the good stories that we, we talk about. So I think there's a very high imperative to change, but it needs a collective action of, and, and a joined up action to be able to shift the thing back to the way it should be. Thank you. Tijan. Yeah, I, I, I like to pick up, I mean, all the points are well taken on Mark's point on the 97%. I could not agree more. I'll just illustrate one example, and a gentleman from LBS raised that. I was at the pool in Q408, and the share price, there was such volatility in the share price. We had such intraday falls that I said, okay, pull me down the 10 worst intraday falls in, it was Prudential 1848, okay, so it was 160 years of history, okay? Six of the 10 had happened in October 08. I was sitting in my office, a friend called me, said, oh, I was having dinner, those hedge funds, they were just laughing their heads off. They drove a share price of Peru all the way down to 190. It was a one-way directional bet. They made so much money, okay? That has nothing to do with economic reality. There was no way in that crisis that company was ever gonna go bankrupt. And it was just like printing money, okay? And in the end, in spite, and I'm a free market guy, I'm a total capitalist, but in the end, you know, they had to intervene and stop short selling in London because it had become a joke. So, uh, I mean, there is, there is a, a tension there between the 97% who are long-term holders who need sometimes to protect the company, protect management, protect the long-term interest of the company. Because as much as I like market, there are market failures sometimes. And I think those are the extreme cases that actually do a lot of damage to the cause of capitalism. And, and that have been used by people who want to argue against capitalism as a, a reason for to throw the baby with the bathwater. So I think we have a lot of work to do there. And I welcome the group that you guys have constituted. And maybe if you don't co-opt me, I'll join anyway. Thank you, Sita. Well, much has been said, and I agree with all of them. I just want to add one thing, is that the more the complex the world is, we all know that how to manage it is with more diversity. And I want to add this, that there is some studies, not concrete evidence yet, but if you have more women in your boards, you may have more, more long-term view. 
There are studies on this. Thank you, Gula. Larry, for the final provocative comment. Yes. I agree. On, I just added four women on my board. Um, <laughs> Well, I think the, the statistics that Michael brought up are, are, are kind of erroneous. Um, uh, the velocity of money has been increasing primarily for three reasons. Hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, central banks. Um, and the velocity of money has increased quite considerably in those three sectors. Uh, um, obviously, hedge funds, and Tijan was talking about some hedge funds related to, to his prior job. Um, the velocity of money there is uh, incredible. Now, who are the investors behind these hedge funds? They're pension funds, getting back to this <laughs> maximization of return. Um, but the other major trend is trend more uh, out of active management into, into passive. And passive, you own those stocks forever. Um, you know, if they're a part of an index, you own them. And, you know, the problem of being an index, you own some really crappy companies and you own some good companies. And so you actually have, as a, uh, as a passive manager or large scale, you have to actually have more engagement. But I, I, I think the trends are twofold. One, more money towards hedge funds, which increases the velocity of money. Greater outflows from active management towards passive management. And then you have more elongation. So I don't... You know, so the statistics are heavily skewed by the velocity of money by hedge funds, and I'm not sure of that. I mean, I can tell you as a public CEO, I have my two largest shareholders, um, one of them invested on the IPO. They still remain to be one of the largest shareholders, and now that's 16 years. So I, don't, I, I have not witnessed uh, uh, as, as a CEO uh, the velocity that you're talking about related to long-term shareholders and re then related to politicians. Um, for those who are constantly focusing on um, his or her um, re-election and nothing more, um, uh, we need a revolution. Um, <laughs> and right now, unfortunately, the revolution may be Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Larry, this only demonstrates that the, sh that the short term prevails over the long term. Uh, well, we were, going, we were discussing the long-term imperative. It was a very candid, very fruitful discussion. Thank you all, and uh, uh, enabling me to, uh, to direct it as I tried. I have one takeaway, actually two. Everybody spoke about three takeaways. Everyone spoke about the need to educate others. Secondly, everyone agreed that there is a very serious need for redefining fiduciary obligation. Uh, and there are actions underway. That's very important to keep that in mind. And finally, I noticed that geopolitics hardly played a role while that, in the end, through the transmission mechanism, is going to be deciding for the long term. Thank you all. Have a nice day.